Right. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'm really honored to be here uh, sharing a, a little bit of our experience in running an OpenStack public cloud with you. Um, this presentation is about uh, all the things I wish someone had told me uh, and told us before we started running OpenStack and trying to condense our uh, four years of experience uh, running OpenStack uh, to you guys. Um, my name is Bruno. I work for a company called Catalyst IT. Um, Catalyst has its headquarters in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, we also have offices in Australia and in the UK. In about three and a half years ago, four years ago, we started a private uh, cloud implementation based on OpenStack, which later on became the Catalyst Cloud, the first public cloud uh, based in New Zealand. Um, I feel extremely privileged to work for Catalyst and to work on the Catalyst Cloud. Um, I guess when you see that map that the OpenStack Foundation often puts up showing all the OpenStack public clouds, we are that little dot there in the corner. Um, the, the interesting thing about working in, in New Zealand is that um, one, this, the, the scale, the proportion of the country is different from, from other countries I've been, uh, and that allows you to, um, it exposes you to the whole problem space, right? I was there at the beginning when we had the idea of doing an OpenStack private cloud, and I've gone through um, the design, the implementation, the running it in production, um, and, and all the different aspects uh, of, of running an OpenStack cloud. And I'm sure that if I was working you know, back in Brazil, where I'm originally from, or for uh, other companies, I wouldn't have been exposed to that much. Um, so I would like to start with a disclaimer here. Um, I'm not here to sell you a product. This is a very important disclaimer, actually. Um, at, at Catalyst, everything we do uh, is based on open source software and open source technologies, but we don't sell products. We actually provide services to customers. And what that means is that I'm not here to sell you an OpenStack distribution. I'm not here to sell you an OpenStack appliance or hardware that integrates with OpenStack. So I can freely and truthfully share this information with you with no conflicts of interest uh, and, and just in the interest of you know, potentially helping you in your journey with, with OpenStack. So the first question people often ask me when deploying an OpenStack cloud is how much will it cost? So let's get that out of the way first. Um, I'll probably uh, suggest that an OpenStack cloud will cost you something, a, a production, may I say, OpenStack cloud, will cost you something um, around $150,000 uh, one-off for your production hardware and for your pre-production environment. And by the way, you need one, right? From the beginning, if you're doing open second production, you need a pre-production environment that resembles your production and allows you uh, to rehearse whatever you're doing in production there, uh, in ensuring that you're not introducing regressions to production uh, when doing a major open sec upgrade, for example. So do consider in your budget a pre-production environment from day one. Uh, doesn't need to be brand new hardware, uh, but it needs to be there. Uh, the second thing is you'll probably need two to three people per month to run OpenStack. Um, and in the beginning, it, it's probably worth, you know, if you're not keen to invest there, to have a service provider managing it remotely for you. Uh, there are many companies that will do this for you. Um, Catalyst is one of them, but you guys know, uh, you know, I, I'm here at the summit often. Uh, I've met with other OpenStack service providers, and I can tell you that on average, they will charge you something like six to $10,000 per month to begin with, and then, uh, as your cloud grows, as you get more regions, more nodes, they will grow with you. But there's definitely a point where um, having your own people managing your uh, public or private cloud uh, will, will be better than having a service provider doing it for you. Uh, just consider that in the beginning. Now, when it comes to selecting your hardware, um, if you're um, getting some network gear for an OpenStack uh, cloud, you probably want to look at um, Top rack switches, so probably two 10 gig switches for a rack. Um, if you're starting with more than a single rack, then you also want your spine layer there, so you probably want two 40 gig switches for your spine. Uh, you will have a management network, um, so a one gig switch for your management network, and don't forget the switch for the pre-prod cluster. I'll keep on going back to that uh, every now and then. 
the, the good news is these two switches are not required on day one. Uh, you may not need your spine layer on day one, you may not need your management switch on day one, and that's because you can overload your 10 gig um, top rack switches uh, and, and put some management ports in there. And then as you grow, you take those management ports out and you offload them to a dedicated management switch and to you know, later on expanding to, to a spine um, switch as well to grow beyond a rack. But what you need on day one is a plan. It's a, a, your network topology, your design, so that when you get to that point that you're growing beyond a single rack, you know how you're gonna take that next step and it's not a surprise for you, right? So you don't necessarily buy them, but make sure that you have a plan on what you will do when you need the, the, the spine layer. When it comes to features, um, the features that you probably want to look at on your switches are uh, VLAN or VXLAN, uh, probably VXLAN nowadays, uh, MLEG, uh, and it's very interesting to have some form of layer three routing um, with um, BGP, ECMP. Um, I would say it's all right if you like Cisco, Juniper, Arista, no problem at all. You know, you use your preferred switches, but the reality is you don't need these switches anymore. Uh, there are plenty of decent um, generic switches, white box hardware that you can get out there that use exactly the same Broadcom chipset that you will find in, in those switches. Um, and you have very good um, open source uh, switch operating systems available nowadays like Cumulus Linux and those solutions, they play really well with, with OpenStack. So if you're starting now, consider using open source switches and open hardware fr from the beginning. It's definitely possible to do that on the network side. Um, what I would suggest is if you are, uh, for some reason, using um, a Cisco or a Juniper, uh, I would avoid using the vendor-specific uh, Neutron provider, the Neutron driver for, for that switch. Uh, it's tempting, and in some cases you may want or need to use that driver, um, but, but the reality is um, an abstraction layer or a virtual switch like OpenV switch can do wonders for you, and it gives you that abstraction layer that allows you to change uh, hardware vendors for your, uh, your network fabric uh, when um, you need it. So I, I'll bet with you that in two years time, three years time, you'll be doing something different in your network layer than you're doing now. Uh, we've gone through that and keep on iterating on the network very often. So having that abstraction layer that allows you to buy the switches that make sense uh, for you at a given point in time, both from a commercial but also from a technical point of view, uh, is a very interesting advantage uh, w when running a public cloud. Now, when it comes to server specifications, um, in what I have here is, by the way, um, I'm splitting uh, the OpenStack private cloud or public cloud deployment here in four node categories. I'll, I'll explain more about that later. That the, the idea of hyper, a hyper-converged infrastructure is great, um, but I'll tell you some of the pros and cons of doing that um, later during the presentation. But assuming you have four different node types in the beginning, um, you will have a controller, uh, controller nodes, a control plane with three controller nodes at least. Uh, and they will have something like 12 to 16 cores, 64 to 128 gigs of RAM. But I guess the most important thing on your control plane is that you probably want something like 400 gigabytes of SSD storage in there. And that's because there's a lot going on on your control plane. Uh, you have your... Um, database, your MariaDB, your MySQL, uh, you have uh, RabbitMQ, you have po probably a Mongo backing your um, Silometer. So there is a lot of data going on there, a lot of transactions, and some of these queries, they are not optimal, a a as you know, and having the SSDs on your control plane will make a massive difference in terms of the performance of the APIs. Um, then for your compute nodes, um, you could easily start with something like a 12 core node uh, going uh, all the way up. Nowadays with a one unit server, you can easily get 44 cores uh, in those servers. So on the Catalyst Public Cloud, we currently have nodes with 44 cores, 768 uh, gigabytes of RAM. Um, the more CPU and RAM you can put on that compute node, uh, the better from a financial point of view it will be when you're trying to find your price per vCPU, your price per gigabyte of RAM. But what you need to be aware there is your failure domain, right? If you have nodes that are too dense 
when one of those nodes fail, they are impacting a lot of customers. There are a lot of computing since a lot of virtual machines that are affected. And right at the beginning, you may not have that many nodes uh, for, to work with those failures. So what you may want to do is to start your cloud with smaller compute nodes and more of them, you know, maybe six, maybe 10 if you can. And then as you grow and reach a certain scale, then you increase the density of your compute nodes to something like that. Um, when it comes to block storage, um, I'm assuming you're using something like Ceph, a distri open source distributed uh, storage solution in there. If you're not using Ceph, I would strongly consider, uh, ask you to reconsider and have a look at it. It's uh, really awesome. Um, and one of the biggest things we've learned when running Ceph is that um, you could get one PCIe SSD card with something like 400 um, gigabytes and actually have that as the journal for all your OSDs in that server. And I'm assuming something like 12 disks uh, per, per storage node for block storage. Uh, and, and that works really well when it comes to performance, but also uh, the price point uh, per gigabyte that you will achieve. Uh, definitely possible not to have that PCIe SSD and go for it, um, you know, four or five disks per SSD drive. Um, but this uh, ended up working much better for us. And when it comes to object storage, um, I would strongly suggest looking at the uh, servers. You guys may have seen the um, backup guys, Backblaze, and their chassis with 60, I think, 60 drives, 63 and a half inch drives in there. Uh, there are other vendors that are uh, manufacturing servers inspired by their design. Um, Supermicro has got an interesting storage server. Um, I think Dell has also released something that has got 60 drives in there, and you can definitely buy the, the, the original 60 drive design from Backblaze. Uh, a company called 45 Drives, I think, will, will sell you that chassis. Uh, the interesting thing is, as soon as you start, uh, um, as, as soon as you have uh, 64 to 6 terabyte hard drives in, in an object storage node, and you have a few object storage nodes, uh, you reach that price point uh, that is actually cheaper than doing object storage with Amazon, with Azure, with um, the Google Cloud, right? So that density on the object storage side actually matters, and it's how you drive your, your, your prices down. Uh, erasure coding, awesome, but what I'm saying here is with three full replicas of your data, you could still achieve a price point that is cheaper than Amazon S3 uh, if you have this kind of node density. Uh, when it comes to the hardware we are using there, um, in, in one of our data centers, uh, we are using open compute hardware. Um, for another data center, we, we can work with the density uh, of open compute hardware, so we are using generic Intel servers. Nothing special there. Uh, we, we don't buy Dell servers, we don't buy Intel, uh, we don't buy IBM, sorry. Uh, at end of the day, the components inside all these servers they look the same. So whatever you're happy with, uh, that, that works for you. Um, now, I would like to address um, this question here. Uh, I hear in a lot of presentations people saying, yes, OpenStack can pretty much work with all the hypervisors out there. That's true. Um, OpenStack does work with most hypervisors on the industry. There are successful deployments with VMware, with Hyper-V, and so on. Uh, but what we have found is that KVM is by far the most widely adopted and best supported hypervisor in the ecosystem right now. If you go to the community and you say, hey, I'm working on this bug here, on this issue here, and it's you know, a KVM uh, hypervisor, you get much more support and engagement from the community uh, than you would with other hypervisors. The, the other thing is if you look at the uh, support matrix, I think Nova Seal has gotten one of the wiki pages there, the, um, matrix showing the features supported by each hypervisor, you see that KVM and Zen um, provide you with most features uh, compared to other hypervisors. So, um, and, and finally, if, if you're looking at this from a financial point of view, that's where the numbers stack up, right? I've done the business model, the financial model for both uh, a cloud running with VMware and KVM and Zen. Um, and the open source, uh, it, using open source is where the, where the numbers make sense. So do consider that, unless you have a very special deal um, with, with someone like VMware or Microsoft. Um, now let's go back to the topic of node segmentation. Um, one of the reasons you want to do node segmentation if you are a public cloud provider is for financial reasons. And that's because you end up specializing your nodes so that you achieve an optimal price point for each one of the services you're providing. So 
Uh, for object storage, like I said, you're probably trying to jam you know, as many disks as you can on a node. There is, again, the failure uh, domain, the, the size of the failure domain that you want to be careful there. Uh, but you do want a, a, a high number of disks per node. Whereas for block storage, it's in your interest to optimize it for performance. You're probably chasing something like all my I.O. operations will be completed under 30 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds. So your interest here, the types of disk you would use, the architecture you would use is likely different. Whereas for compute, you may want a lot of GPUs. You know, depending on your workload, if you are doing uh, research, you may want a lot of GPUs inside your compute nodes. And, and trying to get all those things in, in a hyper-converged uh, infrastructure where you just have a one node type, uh, it, it may not be possible, right? It may be really hard. And especially when it comes to achieving those price points that are competitive on a, you know, with global cloud providers, uh, I would say it's probably impossible in a hyper-converged infrastructure. Um, now, the second part of this presentation is about techniques to drive quality and service levels up. In, I'm going to talk again about node segmentation, but this time for, for a different reason. Um, when it comes to service levels, uh, we have found some potential issues with hyperconvergence. Uh, actually, our first uh, cloud region was running compute and block storage, object storage, all in the same node, right? We had a compute object block node. Um, and what we have found is that we started running um, into um, a few bugs that are bleeding edge bugs on, on the Linux kernel, for example, where you know, if you have compute instance there, uh, the, the more compute instances you put, the more uh, RAM you're using on those servers, and then you get to si some, some high memory utilization on those nodes, and then we ended up he uh, reaching um, kernel bugs related to the proc file system, for example, that only happen in that circumstance of you know, very high memory utilization and Ceph doing something here. In, um, I'm, I'm talking about the kind of uh, incident and issue that uh, required us to interact with the you know, Linux kernel maintainers, document the bug, understand it, interact with the community, patch, fix, roll that out to our production. You know, so it, it does require a, a, a significant level of engineering there to run that hyper-converged infrastructure. And what we have found is that as soon as we started splitting uh, our services in, into discrete layers, here's our compute, our object storage, our block storage, our network nodes, our service levels went up. Now, let's talk about useful techniques to drive your service levels up. The first one already makes an assumption that you're deploying your OpenStack Cloud uh, using a configuration management system like Puppet, Ansible, Salt, Chef, whatever you prefer, right? Doing OpenStack in production without such a configuration management system, uh, it, it would be very hard. So from the beginning, your OpenStack cloud is software and you're driving it using a configuration management system. So one, one of the first things I would do when deploying a production OpenStack cloud nowadays is to actually create a test environment that runs inside my cloud, but in the beginning also on someone else's cloud in case mine is not there when I need it. Uh, and, and that test environment will resemble what I have in production, you know, the, the same number of nodes, the same network topology, as close as possible to it, so that I can run my automated tests um, on, on that infrastructure. And I would inter integrate, I, what we've done is we have integrated that in, in our CI. So every time we change a line of code in OpenStack or in our configuration management system, if we change a, sim a simple line in Puppet saying this configuration changes from A to B, that triggers a CI job that spins up a cloud inside our cloud, run all our automated tests, and make sure we haven't introduced any regressions. Now, an interesting trick that we found along the way is we wanted to test um, our cloud as users would actually use them. Uh, use it. So uh, what we have found is that the Tempest scenario tests actually behave and do a lot of operations using the APIs like your cloud customers would, be, be them internal or external cloud customers. So if you haven't seen the uh, Tempest scenario tests, uh, I'll give you one example. One of the tests will launch a compute instance, attach some block storage to it, write some data to that block storage, detach the volume from the instance, attach to another instance, and check to see if the data uh, is there and it's what you've written, right? So a lot of tests and a lot of operations um, 
that your customers would do when consuming these services from you. So what is interesting about Tempest is, is that you can actually use it as a gateway in, in your CI. So every time you change a line of configuration or a line of code, Tempest, uh, the scenario test will run, exercise that functionality and say, okay, from an end user point of view, you haven't introduced any regressions as far as my test coverage is concerned. Uh, but the other interesting thing we've done is uh, we actually run the Tempest scenario tests from uh, every hour in our production cloud uh, as, um, uh, as monitoring, right? As a form of monitoring, uh, complementing, of course, the individual service and component checks from um, Nagios, like Chinga, and, and other services uh, that we use for monitoring. Uh, but what is interesting here is that we have, you know, uh, Tempest doing the every hour every operation that our customers are expected to do with our services and telling us, yes, it's working as expected. People can create a new network. They can attach a, a compute instance uh, to, to that network and so on. Um, the next one is, I have mentioned that already, have a decent pre-production environment. And that's because, you know, even though you have your uh, test environment in, in your cloud or someone else's cloud, um, you, you will get to a point where you want to rehearse the operation that you're about to do in production in an environment that actually resembles it for real, with real switches, with the real network configuration that you have there. Um, and in the context of uh, upgrading OpenStack to the next uh, major release of OpenStack, this is really important. Um, fourth one is think about communication channels with customers and prepare communication tools ahead of time. So what we have found is, um, when you have an incident in a cloud environment, let's say a compute node went down and a number of compute instances were affected, you probably want to contact these customers that were affected as quickly as possible to let them know, hey guys, I know that your compute instance is down. Uh, we are working on it. They are being restarted in, in another uh, server uh, that is healthy. Um, we are on top of it. You don't need to worry about it. Right? And, and to do this in, in a cloud environment actually requires some tools that we didn't have before. So what we ended up doing was to create tools that would, we can point to a compute node or to a network node that has failed and say, tell me all the compute instances that were here, the tenants that own those instances, and by the way, go to our CRM and fetch the contacts from this customer so I can email them, give them a call and say, we're on top of this. Um, and in, in terms of providing good service levels, um, we, we found that this was fundamental. Uh, it also allows you to talk to the people that were uh, affected and, and that actually required that communication instead of broadcasting that failure to everyone and saying, hey, uh, this is happening. Um, we, we did that in the past and what happens is we get a lot of calls and, and people saying, okay, uh, have I been affected? Is, is, is there something wrong with my own servers? Uh, no, actually you haven't. So these tools um, are, are very useful to plan in advance. Um, by the way, if you are doing configuration management and you have the ability to say, hey, I've wrecked a server, this is a compute node, installed Nova and all the components that I need in a compute node, why not tweaking your configuration management um, manifests or playbooks or depending on the technology you're using and, and introduce the monitoring right there. So every time you wreck a new compute node, every, every time you wreck a new storage node, your monitoring systems are immediately aware I have a new storage node on the network that I need to monitor, and you start monitoring that straight away. Now, in-place upgrades. I have a friend called Sergey, and I meet him um, at LCA pretty much every year. And last year, Sergey was telling me, Bruno, have you ever upgraded the um, Catalyst Cloud in production, or the cloud team at Catalyst? Have you guys ever upgraded the Catalyst Cloud in production? I said, yep. Yeah. And he said, no, that's not possible. I hear that OpenStack uh, upgrades are impossible, no. You know, I don't believe you, you can't do rolling upgrades. No, for, for some time, this is a reality. In the beginning, it was really hard to do major upgrades of OpenStack. Um, but nowadays, most services will have a backward compatible API that will support the last version uh, of, of the API. And what that allows you to do is to upgrade one service at a time. You would typically start with your Keystone and then um, go to something like uh, Nova and then service by service, uh, you, you upgrade that. And, just check, make sure that when you're deploying a new service, some of the uh, newer services under the big tent, uh, they don't necessarily have that capability, uh, but you know, Nova, Swift, the usual suspects, they're all capable um, of doing that. Um, the important thing is, 
test every change uh, you're about to do in CI with your automated tests. And the better your automated tests are, um, the less likely you are of introducing a regression to production. Rehearse every movement in, in pre-production. Um, we have found that it was uh, extremely beneficial to work on improving uh, live migration and making sure that live migration was as bulletproof as we could make it. Uh, in Imitaka, there were uh, many features introduced in Imitaka that makes uh, live migration much better. Uh, the, the thing is, you know, as cloud operators, you still want to have a life, you still want to work, uh, you know, as much as possible during business hours, not 3 a.m. in the morning or funny hours in, uh, d during the night. Uh, so the, having the ability to migrate customers away from a hypervisor to do maintenance, to do a, a, an upgrade of Nova is really useful. Uh, but not only at that level, um, what we've done was to develop and also improve some existing community scripts. Uh, I think most of that, I'm pretty sure most of that is uh, contributed back upstream, uh, where we can now migrate routers from uh, a network node to another network node with minimum downtime. Um, so we can also take network nodes down for maintenance without impacting the network for our customers. And having those uh, tools prepared in advance uh, will we'll put you in a good place to do in-place upgrades. Now, the third part of this presentation is about common, common deployment mistakes. And I would like to start with the number one mistake, which is uh, GUI-driven OpenStack. Um, I see a lot of people deploying OpenStack and expecting that there will be a graphical user interface and I push a button and off you go, you have OpenStack. And, and it's true, those things exist. You know, look at Mirantis Fuel, for example. Great interface for you to deploy OpenStack. The point is, the problem is not on the deployment uh, itself. Getting OpenStack up and running um, is nowadays relatively straightforward. The thing is, once OpenStack is running, it is a CU, a complex distributed system with lots of moving parts that someone needs to understand and needs to be capable of going down, you know, the, the network level, uh, in, inspect, you know, run a, a TCP dump inside a, a kernel namespace to find out what's happening on, w with a specific router. And if you don't have engineers that are capable of going down that level, uh, it will be very hard for you to run OpenStack in production with good um, service levels. I have seen great tools for us to deploy OpenStack that have a nice, you know, uh, Juju-like interface, drag and drop, and, and you have OpenStack. But the point is, can you run and maintain that after you have deployed? And as soon as you get to the point where you can run and maintain that at that level, that level of engineering capability, then you probably don't care about the GUI to, to deploy OpenStack anymore because you would know how to run you know, your own Puppet, Manifest, Chef, or Ansible and, and, and get things going. Um, so please don't think that just because you could get OpenStack running with DevStack or um, something like Fuel, you're ready to go to production. Um, this is a big mistake, right? And, and if you take away one thing from this presentation, I would like to be this. Uh, don't carry on your own patches unless you have to, unless you must do this. Um, as a rule of thumb, what I would suggest is that you never run code in production that hasn't been merged upstream. Every time you, de you develop a patch or a customization to OpenStack that is not committed upstream, you're creating a recurring overhead on the team with every release of OpenStack, and that happens every six months. So every six months, your team will need to look at that patch, that little change you've done, make sure it works with the new version and the changes, unless you're doing something uh, funky with you know, following master and, and continuously um, uh, checking that against the latest changes in, in master. Um, but you know, we've seen big companies messing up with this one. Um, uh, as an example, I know that uh, HP Enterprise uh, was stuck for a long time, I think in the Diablo version of OpenStack with a lot of patches they've developed themselves. And it took them a lot of time, effort, and money to get out of that situation into, back into you know, vanilla OpenStack. Um, so I would say don't do it unless it's absolutely necessary and be prepared, on, on the other hand, you need to be prepared to fix bugs and introduce new features upstream. If you are running OpenStack in production, you will probably stumble upon bugs that affect you and, and you will need some engineering capability to do that upstream or 
have a relationship with a service provider that is capable of patching that upstream for you. And once it's patched upstream, that's fine. You know, backport your patches, apply to your cloud. That's, um, there were situations, and there are still a few situations, where we had to carry on our own patches on, on, on the Catalyst Cloud. Um, we choose very carefully uh, when, when we use that bullet. Um, the next mistake is uh, the cloud is not a hypervisor. So long story short, if you're looking at OpenStack because uh, you're looking for a VMware replacement, you're looking at the wrong thing. Um, if you just need a VMware ESX uh, re replacement for the hypervisor, look at KVM, look at Zen, and look at the uh, management tools around KVM and Zen. Um, OpenStack is a cloud operating system. It's touching pretty much every part of your data center to run your infrastructure. Um, it can do much more for you than um, what VMware does. Um, but at the same time, it's more complex to um, implement and to operate in production. So not a VMware uh, hypervisor replacement. Next one is Keystone is not an IDP. So in the beginning, it's probably all right for you to use Keystone um, as your backend for uh, identity information, your user credentials. Um, but I would suggest that from the beginning, plan what will be your IDP in the future. You know, the, you may have OpenLDAP, Active Directory, a SAML-based IDP uh, as your preferred technology there. Uh, think about how people will create, uh, terminate reset, uh, accounts, reset their passwords, and how that information will flow um, to, to Keystone. The last one that I want to address is all projects are production ready, right? So a project exists, therefore I can do it in production. Well, that's not necessarily the case. There are some projects that have been around for a while. Um, some of them have been uh, in development for the last two years, and we have decided not to implement them on the Catalyst Cloud yet because we don't consider them production ready. So how would I identify a project that is ready? Um, first of all, I would suggest um, understand your requirements well, understand what you expect from as functional requirements, but more importantly, your non-functional requirements, and, and validate them, you know, deploy that service, even if it's in DevStack, deploy that service and validate your requirements in, in real life. Um, the, the ones that, you know, people often miss are uh, high availability. Can, can I actually deploy this with high availability? Um, upgrade procedures. Will, once I deploy this, will I be able to upgrade it in production and keep on rolling to the next version? How easy will that be? Um, and security standards, right? Don't take for granted that just because a project exists, it's secure. I won't mention any names um, because I don't want to of offend any of the projects here, but we've found one specific project in OpenStack that a lot of people are using in production. Uh, we are aware uh, and have raised a security issue already uh, in, in relation to that project. That sec specific security issue hasn't been fixed yet. Um, and yet, there are people running in production, and I would consider myself that security issue uh, very dangerous. So I would even consider doing a code inspection yourself if, if, if you can. You know, at, at least look at the architecture of that system, how it works, and you know, sometimes you will find some obvious issues there. Um, if you want to know more about this one, talk to me later. I'm more than happy to share that with you. Uh, personally. Um, and I would like to conclude this presentation with the question, um, do the numbers stack up? Uh, can, could an OpenStack uh, private cloud be cheaper than something um, like Amazon AWS? So what I would like to show you here is um, I've got those numbers yesterday from the AWS calculator. Um, this is how much it costs uh, for you to run an M4 large compute instance in the Sydney region. M4 large is um, two vCPUs, eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, and then you say, okay, Bruno, Sydney is not the cheapest AWS region uh, in the United States, hardware is cheaper, so uh, what about the US price? So that's the same um, computing instance in the United States. And then the next question will be, okay, but that's not the cheapest price I can get out of AWS. I could pay for a reserved instance. Maybe I can reserve my instance for three years and pay everything up front, and that's when I get my highest discount on, on AWS for a computing instance. So how about that price? Um, and, and that is the um, lowest price you would get right now uh, from, from AWS for an M4 large computing instance. Um, and this is actually um, how much that same computing instance would cost on, on an OpenStack private cloud 
with a reasonable size, right? And if you want to understand exactly how I arrived at that number, there is a presentation going on tomorrow called um, Can OpenStack Beat Amazon AWS in Price? It is at 11.15 um, or 11.25 tomorrow uh, on this floor. Just don't remember the number of the room. Um, go and check it out because on that presentation, myself and another guy called Bruno from uh, Internet, what we are doing is to show you um, the actual uh, total cost of ownership model behind this number and how the prices compare uh, between OpenStack and Amazon AWS for uh, compute, block storage, object storage, network. Um, and, and what we are doing is I'm providing numbers for the OpenStack private uh, cloud implementation and Bruno's providing numbers for an OpenStack public cloud implementation based on their public cloud. So that's it from me today. Um, if you have questions, more than happy. Thank you. Just remember to use the microphone, please. Right, no questions. Thank you very much for your time.